Hello, everyone. Um, today I am introducing Chris Morrison of Via Veris. Um, hi, Chris. How are you? Good, Neil. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining today. I'm really excited about uh, the topic we're going to talk about today. Me, I am as well, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So um, to start with, uh, would you please describe your background and your current role and, you know, if you have any specialties or a niche that you fill? So probably going back further than you want, but uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trained originally as an engineer, but never practiced. Um, but I've spent my whole career um, in the healthcare, life science, med tech um, field. Um, early on, I uh, I, I ran medical practices and ambulatory surgery centers, but early on in my career, I got in sales. So mm -hmm. um, for the last 30 plus years, I've been in sales, but um, early on in my, my sales experience, I, uh, one of my early jobs happened to be with a startup. Um, and this is going back 30 plus years now. And, uh, yeah. and honestly, um, once I got the startup bug, I've never, I've, it, I've never done anything different ever since then. It's just, uh, what I do and what I love, I just love helping companies launch new disruptive products. Um, so that's wonderful. So you've been in the space for a long time. Yes. Well, pretty much my whole career. And, and I yeah. grew up in a family of physicians. So I, you know, maybe even before my career started, I've been in the healthcare life science field. Wonderful. And there's, um, there's something unique about your sales experience. I know, you know, people might think, you know, there are a lot of sales reps out there for Medtronic or whatever, but you've actually launched, you know, multiple new devices as opposed to selling one that's, that already exists. Yeah. So, you know, when, you know, and I say going back 30 years, I did my first one. I've never sold any in that, in the last 30 years, I've never sold anything other than launching something for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's all I've done for the last 30 years. I've never gone back and sold an established product ever again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I you know, and then for the last 15 plus years, I've had my own consulting business via Veris, mm -hmm. and that's you know, that's all we focus on. Wonderful. Um, and I know you have this um, AME Customer Discovery Bootcamp. Um, what is AME? So a AME stands for Agile Market Entry, um, and it actually. It came out a friend of mine who happens to be an entrepreneurial professor at UNC Chapel Hill actually suggested the name to me. But mm -hmm. and where it came out of and why I created a, a Agile Market Entry and AME is that, I don't know, going back five or six years ago, I, I started looking back at my career and what I was coaching and working with my customers on. And one of the things I realized I don't know why this didn't dawn on me earlier, is that I was talking a different language than the most salespeople. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that was a natural evolution for me doing startups over and over again, because frankly, the process of selling before you get to scale is a very different process than selling once you're at scale, which is what pretty much everybody refers to as sales is, is, mm -hmm. is sales at scale. Right. Um, so I created Agile Market Entry or AME to distinguish those two different things, how we sell and how we address, how did we develop the market pre-scale as opposed to post-scale? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good point. And um, I think the first question that jumped to my mind when I heard about your bootcamp is, you know, when people hear customer discovery, they automatically assume i you know, which is run by the NSF, um, NIH, and several other places. So how is your customer discovery different mm -hmm. from that of i -Core? So, um, good question. Um, and so, uh, well, let me first, if you go back to where i started from, it mm -hmm. kind of was started from Steve Blank and his work out of Stanford right. and UC Berkeley. Um, and first of all, I say, you know, the, the, you know, his book, The Five Steps to the Epiphany, his um, getting out in the world and saying, get out of the office mm -hmm. and go talk to customers has had a huge impact because it was what was needed. And it's really what's needed still today. Um, we tend to do, a, you know, if you look at um, where we spend our resources in early development, it's always mm -hmm. on product development. 95, 90% right. of our resources go there. But the risk um, tends to lie on the market development side greater than the product development side. So this focus on 
customer discovery and getting out of the office and understanding the customer and addressing the needs your you know the customer needs that we're going to address is absolutely critical so that's first thing that's a critical and we and and and, and we need to start there but yeah. where the boot camp kind of differentiates from what you get out of i -Corps, um a couple areas one is Steve Blank's focus, he's a marketing guy. So it's, mm -hmm. it starts more from a marketing perspective. It also comes, if you look at his early work, he was in the technology IT area. So how we manage things in, um, and, and, and that arena tends, the sales process tends to be much, much more market, marketing oriented. Mm -hmm. When you talk about sales in, the, in our world, the med tech world and the life sciences world, it's all B to B. It's not, mm -hmm. and it's very sales, you know, direct sales orientation. So that's one of the one big th things about the boot camp that's different than I core. There's a sales focus to it that you don't yeah. quite get as much. Um, so we'll go deeper into the sales conversation, not just address the needs and the problem set of the customer conversation, which tends to be the focus mm -hmm. of I core. The other thing is, so, and I've done a lot of work with UNC Chapel Hill with the boot camp. That's actually kind of where we initiated and started it. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, and I must, I'll tell you, I've never done I Corps, so I've been, you know, so I'm, I, what I know about I Corps is secondhand. Yeah. And then talk with the folks at UNC Chapel Hill um, that have gone through, that have companies that go through our I Corps and have gone through it, and they actually are, have, take their companies through my boot camp as well where they think is it's the next step that you would go through after mm. you go through i -Corps. i -Corps, it's great getting out, talking to customers, understanding the need and the problem set, but to develop your company further and start thinking about the launch and the sales process, that's where the boot camp really comes in. It's, it's right. The other th third place I would distinguish it is I I would think of i it's kind of a sledgehammer approach or a, mm axe approach whereas i think of the boot camp is more of a scalpel approach so comparing mm -hmm. it you know you know you're going at it and just you know you're going at it with an axe whereas with the boot camp we tend to be it tends to be a little more nuanced we go in a lot mm -hmm. into the underlying pr principles of why you want to do it so yeah and and, and uh and the behaviors that you should be uh, addressing at this early stage so that when you get the answers back from the market that are going to be different for different companies, you have, have an idea, have a little better sense of how to parse and understand that data. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can, I can definitely see that because, um, yeah, so my, my startup, uh, we've done, uh, the NSF I core. We've okay. also done the NSF, uh, beat the odds Boot Camp, which is a smaller version of I core. Um, and so, yeah, so we, I think, uh, we were able to get, um, really into the clinical. So, um, you know, we we're developing, um, a neurosurgical device. So we were really able to get into what the clinical workflow looks like and what the surgeon needs are, what the clinical needs are, but I've had difficulty trying to figure out uh, like you mentioned, the, the launch strategy, like I'm, I'm still a little lost as to the price, you know, the appropriate pricing or who's going to actually buy the first, like, I don't know, 10 units and, you know, what are realistic sales, uh, sales numbers look like at the start. Um, okay. So um, I want to ask you first, uh, so what are some common mistakes you see when a health or med tech startup uh, launches sales? Yeah. So from on the sales launch. So, so I tell you the product, the most fundamental thing that is the mistake I see is it's we talked about this earlier when I was talking about agile market entry versus sales at scale. Um, well, the most common thing I see is the underlying principles or the thinking behind what we're trying to accomplish at the early stage. Mm -hmm. What I see is, and the mistake being companies kind of assume they're at an act like they're at scale when they're launching a product and the more mm. disruptive and the more disruptive a product is yeah the more you do not have the more you don't know about your sales process and your customer going into that first sale yeah um, so and and when i say that they act like they're at scale there's they start bringing on sales people they start scaling up right. their team they start scaling up marketing they start driving leads without a proven sales process to execute mm. against um and and what 
and what that leads to is a couple things. One is their burn rate goes way up because they're acting like they're at scale. So they, their right. sales and marketing behavior starts mm -hmm. acting like they're at scale. So they're spending like they're at scale. Yeah. But the other thing that happens is because they don't have a proven process and a, and a proven business model in place, they can't effectively use those resources. So, mm -hmm. so, their, so their actual performance in the marketplace is still at a fairly low level. So you see yeah. the burn going up and then the revenue line doesn't go up accordingly. So that's probably the biggest thing. And, mm -hmm. and the fundamental mistake or the fundamental misconception is they're acting like they're at scale when they're at really at a discovery stage and a learning yeah. stage. And they're, you know, and their goal early on should be getting through that learning stage and getting to a repeatable process that they, mm -hmm. for a sales process for their sales team that, that they can execute against. Because until you have that approved repeatable process in place, you can't scale anything and you can't reach profitability. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. So just distinguishing between, uh, you know, the, the launching and the growing of the sales are two separate phases. They're completely separate yeah. phases. And people, pre and, and there's a term for this, it came out of a, a well, the first time I read about it was come to call the, the a report called the Genome Startup Report. And mm -hmm. they, they, they refer to this as premature scaling. Mm -hmm. People get ahead of themselves on scaling up their market development yeah. activity when their product and their company is isn't when they're not ready for that. They don't have product yeah, market yeah. fit. They don't even know who their right customer is. They don't know their sales process. They don't mm -hmm. know the actual sales cycle yet. They don't even know the messaging. Um, yeah. Early on, and if you start scaling all your sales activity before you have all that stuff kind of worked out and understood in a proven process. Um, then your then your efficiency and your performance is go, is not gonna is not gonna be um, co, co, it's not gonna map with your with your burn. Right, right. So yeah, no, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, so yeah, the initial sales are not a smaller version of sales at scale. Um, there are a lot of things we still need to figure out and pivot. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So you mentioned a few things. Um, you know that we need to look out for like. Um, the, the sales cycle, the customers, the messaging, things like that. Um, yeah. So what would you recommend? Um, I think um, earlier uh, before you mentioned that, you know, you, you, to get the first 10 to 15 sales, you know, instead of hiring a sales team, it really should be the founders or the people, you know, uh, working on the company to like be on the ground and try to get those first few sales. So I think it's, so, a couple different things, a couple different things here. So first of all, the people, the founders of the company are critical at this early stage because mm -hmm. uh, a couple reasons. One is when you go to the market as a startup with a new product, you don't have credibility in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So where a lot of that credibility lives is in the technical knowledge and the technical understanding of how the product's going to work. So, so in that right. respect, it's absolutely critical that the that the inventors and the founders are involved in the process. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of that point, you, there's also a myth out there that mm -hmm. your first salesperson should be the founder. Um, that I don't necessarily mm -hmm. agree with. Uh -huh. It's what, what and, and where that myth comes from, it's when you bring in someone that only knows how to do, you know, conventional sales or sales at scale, and you bring them into a startup, they don't know how to manage through this learning discovery stage. Right. So a lot of mistakes, they're the ones that often drive this premature scaling. Yeah. And it's led us to believe that it's not good to bring salespeople in early. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Okay. You've got to bring in the right sales expertise mm -hmm. coming in. Yeah. And if you bring in the expertise that knows how to manage through this early discovery stage, mm -hmm. That's always better than having someone that doesn't know sales leading sales. Right, right, right. So, so it, it's a little bit tricky here. You want mm -hmm. the technical leadership involved. They need to be involved from a credibility standpoint. Yeah. But you also want to bring in experienced sales leadership at that stage that knows how to go through this launch stage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. 
Um, so when do you recommend, you know, if we find someone like you who has experience in launching as opposed to scaling the sales of a product, you know, um, I'm wondering, when should we hire you? When, when should we start engaging you? So that's all. So, so hiring, engaging are two different questions. Yeah. So you know, if we go back to the beginning of the conversation, what's one of the mm -hmm. biggest mistakes? One of the biggest mistakes companies do is they don't spend enough time on market development and they spend too much focus oh, okay. on product development early on so yeah we should be doing market development from day one yeah you know we you know and and that's what you know icor and the boot camp is the you know, icor is designed around that to go understand mm -hmm. the customer needs very early on in your product development process because it informs yeah. Every you know the market's going to be informing everything you do with the business. So right, right. So you should be bringing in, and I do this with a lot of clients at very early stages when they're in product development. I'll just come in and I'll advise them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Or a lot of times I'll just get on the phone and I give away free services. I just mm -hmm. was on the phone phone with a gentleman yesterday that has launched the product, and you know, I gave him I gave him the best advice I could give him in a in an hour long discussion, mm -hmm. but. The point being is you want to bring in early expertise on the market development because it's yeah. so critical. Now, 12 to 18 months before you are ready to launch your product, mm -hmm. you should be getting very, you should then be scaling up your market development. Yeah. You know, going out and, and doing late customer discovery. And when mm -hmm. I say late customer discovery, getting deep into the buying process, mm -hmm. getting deep into the implementation and the adoption process. So yeah. you know, your tech, technology at Neurosonics, you, know, you need to understand how that's gonna be brought into the operating room. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna, you know, what's the scrub nurse gonna, you know, who's gonna be responsible for bringing your technology into the sterile field? Yeah. How do you train those people? You know, how do you train the scrub nurse to support the surgeon? How does the surgeon, how's it, what's going to change and how that procedure is mm -hmm. being done? All that work you should start doing prior yeah. to have to launch because those are all critical things that you're going to have to manage. If you don't manage them prior to launch, you're going to have to manage it after launch and that's lost time. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. And time is money. So you, mm. so I, at least 12 to 18 months before you think you're going to go to market with your product, you should be getting deep in them into this mm -hmm. market, early market development work. And also, you know, I find that a lot of companies are doing clinical trials during that stage. Mm -hmm. And I often see there's a huge missed opportunity you should be doing. And, and, and at that stage, you're glad, gathering clinical data to support mm -hmm. your many times your FDA clearance, right? But also to support the efficacy of your product and all that type of stuff. But but you should be doing um, market development data at that point in time new. And, I, and that's a huge missed opportunity I see all mm -hmm. the time that we have all these resources and we're engaging with clinicians, physicians, and even institutions, a lot of times in hospitals. Yeah. And we're not tapping into the business side of things as well as the clinical side. Right, um, right. So, you know, but on the, but when you hire that first salesperson, um, you know, that, that's a tough one. You know, it, it depends on the company and it depends on the stage, mm -hmm. but um, you should be bringing the expertise in at that stage. When you yeah. hire them, that's all going to be company dependent. And I have clients now, I have a client now where me and my partner or we're going in and we're going to be their fractional sales and marketing leadership mm. for a device being sold into the ophthalmic market. And we will probably be that team for at least the first 18 to 24 uh -huh. months post launch until we get to a repeatable process. Yeah. And then that's the time when you bring in, you know, a VP of sales that's mm. that comes out of industry. Once that, once we know how to develop that market repeatedly, mm. then you bring in your sales expert to start scaling. Okay, that's good to know. And um, I think um, yeah, the next thing I wanna ask about is, some, uh, um, is related to um, uh, you know, the sales met or, or metrics we should be looking for. Um, yeah. I, I know, some, uh, you know something that's 
uh, you know, different about, you know, say medical devices as opposed to, you know, selling an app or a consumer product is that, you know, it takes a long time. There's a lot of development involved until we actually start selling things. And, um, you know, even then, you know, for the first year, maybe, you know, you're only selling a few items. So we're not able to, you know, see, you know, how many apps was there down, you know, how many times was our app downloaded last week or how many times did, you know, somebody click on our website? So how do we know when we're trying to figure out this repeatable sales process, how do we know we're doing things right? <laughs> so, um, so first of all, if you bring something truly disruptive to market, like your technology and a lot of my clients' technologies, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is we're doing something for the first time. So we're right. going into the world of the unknown. Mm -hmm. That is just, so when you do that, you're going to do things wrong. Yeah. It's just, you know, so that's part of it, knowing that you're going in. And like I was sharing with this client, we're, mm -hmm. we just, we're probably going to, well, they're looking to get an FDA clearance in the fourth quarter of this year. We're actually planning that we're going to have to iterate and pivot and change our, and we're building that into our go to market strategy, going into it, knowing, because we know we're going to make mistakes, mm -hmm. but here's the critical thing. What you want to do with any product is figure out what the most critical assumptions you're making. And when I say, the, say critical, the ones that if you're wrong, they're going to either break the company, kill the company, or force a major pivot. Yeah. And those are the things at every moment you want to go after those as quickly, as efficiently as possible, because those mm -hmm. high risk assumptions You've got to get the answers. You've got to know where you're tracking right and where you're tracking wrong with respect yeah. to those assumptions early on. So that's a critical thing. And 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 a lot of that stuff you, you can start doing pre-launch to mm -hmm. go after them. Um, but it, it's really critical once you get launched that you go that you figure out what those things are and go directly at them. Mm -hmm. And you want to build simple experiments, market-based experiments selling to customers, installing in customers, ramping up customers. You want to build simple experiments around testing those critical assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, always the critical assumption, you know, one, you know, I did some work for a client about a year and a half ago. And the first critical assumption was where our call point was. And we had choices. We, we, for the particular procedure we were being disruptive around, which was uh, feeding tubes, Surgeons were placing feeded tubes, GI, gastroenterology was placing feed tubes, and interventional radiologists were placing feeding tubes. Now, this was a disruptive technology that was taking feeding tube placement to the bedside in the ICU. Mm -hmm. What we quickly learned was one, our very first customers were in interventional radiology was a call point, but very quickly within the first two to three months, the key call port became interventionalist in the uh, in the ICU, critical care docs, because we actually started training them to do place feeding tubes for the very first time in their career. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a really critical one. You can't build a sales until you know who you're selling to. Right, you can't right, build right. Any sales model around mm -hmm. until you know who your call point is. So for yeah. that company, that was our critical one. But even after that, then, then, and then once we figured out who that call point was, that changed everything downstream from that, what mm -hmm. the messaging was, what the value, because the value proposition for each of those different call points where it was very different and the motivations of, and the problems we were solving for each of those different mm -hmm. potential customers were different. Some of those customers like the gastroenterologist, they didn't want to see us in the hospital because we were actually a threat. So, oh. so, so you've got, so that's, that's just an example of going at what's the most critical yeah. thing that's going to force either kill your company or pivot your company. You got to go answer those because until you answer that question, we couldn't answer any of the downstream questions about getting to whether a repeatable sales process or a proven business model is going to be. Okay. So when you say call point, do you mean the, you know, the, the place where you make contact with the market or end users or. So, okay. Good question. So. Um, when I, in the beginning of a company, so there's in, you're going to launch a product. The most critical call point is the person that can make the, the decision to buy or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the most critical one. Now you've got other people that are strong influencers 
And then you also have like a lot of times IT or infection prevention or those or these or those peripheral departments can prevent you from getting into the hospital mm -hmm. or in a lot of cases in the healthcare field, like the value analysis committee for the operating right, right. room is critical. Um, so you have, so you want to you got to figure out who's going to make the buying decision mm -hmm. for that client that I was just talking about the key driver. They weren't actually making the buying decision, but they were making the decision whether they wanted to bring the technology into the hospital was the right. position. Mm -hmm. So that was part for it. But then, as I said, the downstream things, and they were the clinical, you had to sell the clinical value to them, but the economic and the buying had to go through the buying groups so that, yeah. or, the, or the value value committees for the mm -hmm. hospital. So, you know, we, we and in that case, you had to deal with both of those, both the economic value decision point as well as the clinical value, de clinical decision point. Um, but right. we had to start with the clinical one to ever get mm -hmm. to the economic one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, so um, that um, that reminds me of something. Um, so, you know, for example, my device is uh, it's an ultrasound focus ultrasound yeah. device. So it can essentially be used in any application where you just want to burn tissue. So um, how should we choose the when we do have a choice of you know multiple customer groups or uh, fields or markets? How should we choose the first one to enter? I think in Icor they usually call it the beachhead market. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of business scores they call it beachhead. I like to call I personally I I like to call it market entry points. Yeah. And the reason I like to call it market entry points is the point. Mm -hmm. Um. So the 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 kind of the very first place you start and you look for that is you've got to especially when you're a small startup company mm -hmm. bringing disruptive technology, you have to go find a problem that the mm -hmm. that your customers already trying to solve yeah to tap into so mm -hmm. and that's you know that's what i -Corps does a lot of going out needs assessment problem right assessment. but you just can't figure out a problem or a need you got to figure out a relative severity of that problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in your case and in my case where we're calling on surgeons a lot if i'm not like in their top two or three problems on a daily basis I'm yeah. not, if I'm seven, eight, nine, or 10, I'm, I'm not going to get their attention. So yeah. the severity of the problem is an issue. So how much do they want mm. to solve the problem? I'll give you an example of this. I was um, working with a client a few years back. They were doing um, a, a technology for doing blunt dissection. Instead of using a cartery to cut, they were doing blunt dissection. And I was, um, and we were talking, and we were, the application we were toying with was in vas vascular access for a, uh, um, dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, and I was referred to a, a vascular surgeon and I got him on the phone, I, but I was referred to him and I got him on a cell phone and I heard all this noise in the back ground. He was walking in the streets in New York City. He, he was from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and he, he goes, Chris, I've got 15 seconds. Tell me what you want to talk about. And I said to him, I told him briefly what we did and what the what we thought the value might be. And he said, Chris, I've been trying to solve that problem for five years. When can you be in my office? Mm -hmm. And when I get a response, and, and you're looking for that type of pool and yeah. that, you know, some that type of problem that you're addressing. So the first one is the severity of the problem, but then you're also mm -hmm. looking for how do you how how big a differential do you have in the value you drop? from the severity of the problem so the, it's a big problem and it's here but here we can solve it and drive this amount of value you're looking for that greatest differential yeah and that tends to be smaller markets you, is you get that yeah. differential up in that high problem high value or mm -hmm. you know severe problem high value that tends to be narrower markets yeah they tend to be smaller so that's why we call them beach heads that's why we call them market entry points because you, that's the easiest path to markets. A lot of times what we hear from business school, we get it reinforced by venture capitalists is mm -hmm. we want to go after these big markets. Right, right. <laughs> but that's not how you enter markets. Yeah. I, and if and if the greatest example that I can probably tell you is Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, they started at Harvard, they went to Ivy League schools, then they dominated universities before they ever brought mm -hmm. it out to the world. Right.
and they became absolute experts in the smaller market, leveraged that to become experts in the large, in the bigger market. And by the time they got to you mm -hmm. and I, to Gray World, they had they had this the model completely cracked at that point yeah. in time and knew how to create really satisfied customers. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. how they and that's how you build, that's how you enter markets efficiently with less cost with a higher probability of success it's yeah. also how you expand beyond that markets to get the bigger markets but you got to be thinking of that it's not just a strategy of entering beachheads but it's a strategy mm -hmm. of entering beaches to get you to these what i call ten tangential or parallel markets that they can continue yeah. to grow and expand expand behind beyond yeah. And I think um, I think last time we talked, you you mentioned also, you know, focusing on a smaller, uh, you know, targeted market. You may help us to fly under the radar if we're, you know, eventually competing with a bigger company. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So um, I'll give you an example um, of it, too. But what I always that's the other it's kind of it's it's a great go to market strategy is going where your competitors aren't or your or your or the competitors don't care mm -hmm. especially when you're a disruptive technology and there's some big you know if you're going against medtronic or right. uh, you know or boston scientific you don't want to go head to head to them in their primary market because as soon as you do you know they can just take a swat and kill you if they want to mm -hmm. but if you yeah. go where they're not paying attention to and don't care about oftentimes you can establish yourself here's a good example i was working with a client and they had a special syringe mm -hmm. for delivering very accurate amounts of uh, of a drug and they thought the original market was going to be delivering chemotherapeutics mm -hmm. uh, and when we did the discovery work, we found a couple things. One is, um, one is the oncologists didn't care if they if a difference on ten percent over over administer under administer efficacy or toxicity that didn't matter to them. So mm -hmm. we weren't addressing a problem that they we weren't addressing something they consider a problem. Yeah. Right. So, but the issue was chemotherapy. That's in the main pharmacy in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the vendors that were addressing that market were selling into. Well, the niche that we learned from doing the discovery work was pediatrics. Mm -hmm. and if you think about pediatrics, first of all, we're not treat, tre treating a cancer with a poison, which, you know, so there's less sensitivity around the efficacy and, and mm -hmm. the uh, toxicity issues there. But we were dealing with newborn kids and where a very a 10 percent um, over administration or other administration could have a huge impact, even yeah. killing them. So that's one thing. But the other thing that's, that was really cool about it is the pediatric pharmacy. They're not getting called on by the by the players in that market. Mm -hmm. So you can enter through the pediatric pharmacy, get credibility with the marketplace very high differential, high risk, yeah. um, because you know, less thing, and, and, and you would get the attention, not just of the pharmacist and the physician, but the CEO and the CFO mm -hmm. of the hospital would, were, was, you know, they were concerned about the death of children yeah. too. So it's a high risk, um, severe pain, high value of delivering a the product, but also staying off the radar of the yeah. competitors. Now, the other thing is the path from the pediatric pharmacy to the main pharmacy is much easier once you're already in the hospital and established. Mm -hmm. Going into the main pharmacy is going to be much easier because you have credibility in that hospital. Mm -hmm. You have the pharmacist talking to the pharmacist. Um, so you have credibility to make that step from the, from the pediatrics into the pharmacy. So even then, if the value of the product was that high in the pediatrics, then the big players can't stop you from making that move because you're already yeah. established. So I have another client I was talking to a couple of years ago that would use the same strategy. Instead of going to the OR, inpatient ORs in the hospitals, they targeted ambulatory surgery centers where, where the profile for their, their competitive profile was much lower as well. So there's these small markets, the big boys tend not to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and it and oftentimes it gives you a path to the larger market as well okay yeah that's that's really interesting and um yeah it's it i don't think it would it would have been obvious earlier on but that makes a lot of sense it is and it's interesting it's counterintuitive it yeah. is counterintuitive <laughs> but when you and i someone once re, i saw this term they call it the elusive obvious once you mm -hmm. hear it it's a, oh yeah that does make sense but the, but the but it's so counterintuitive that the big guys aren't paying attention to it either. Yeah. So it's it's a really you know it's interesting. So you stay off the radar of the big guys. Plus mm -hmm. it's your path to the you know it's and the other thing that's really important about these niche small niche markets mm -hmm. as a as a as a small startup company, you guys can be the experts of experts in these very small markets. Yeah. Um, and when you target small markets like that, that are very focused markets, the cost of going after that market is much lower than going after broad markets. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of advantages to this beachhead or this mm -hmm. or this market entry market entry point strategy that and and the big guys when they launch products don't use this strategy. Mm -hmm. It's not used by the big guys, so they don't even think of this. They want it. They from a from a you know a P and L standpoint, they have to have big revenue streams. Um, yeah. So they go after the big markets, but it would work well. It would work well for them too, but they just don't think that way. Yeah. Um. So that brings me to the last thing I wanted to ask you about. Um. So if if our um you know if if our goal is as a you know, startup founder is to eventually be acquired by these bigger companies mm -hmm. like Medtronic or, you know, Johnson and Johnson. Um, you, you mentioned uh, briefly just now that, you know, these, you know, these bigger companies, they go after bigger markets, they're selling at scale, that's what they're good at. So what are they looking for if they want to acquire, you know, a startup or, uh, or a smaller company or, you know, what can we as a, you know, startup founder, how can we prepare to get to get to that point? Yeah, so that you've got to understand the history of these big companies acquiring mm -hmm. small companies and what's happened a little bit. So what, what, what has happened is that when the big companies have gotten in early, you know, pre launch, um, they've been routinely disappointed by the outcomes of those purchases. And, mm -hmm. and if you think about what they're designed and how they're designed to, to operate, they don't, they're not designed to go through this discovery learning phase. They don't have the skill set. Yeah. Nor do they have the culture that would, that would, that is required to have the patience to go through the, that learning stage. Um, so what ends up happening is they try to launch products the old way, which is going up to big markets broadly, and mm -hmm. they end up being disappointed and they end up failing mm -hmm. because they're they think the path to big is going big right out of the gate. That's not the path to big, yeah. as we've talked about. But the, but what they, what's happened over time is they've learned that mm -hmm. if they invest too early, that those companies fail. Now mm -hmm. they, if you, unless they're really smart, they're gonna they're gonna think that it's the problem of the technology or the company. It's not gonna be that they don't know how to manage through the stage. But that's. But that's no, neither here nor there with it, with respect to this conversation. But what they've learned is they don't buy companies until there's a track record of success in the marketplace. Yeah. And they wouldn't tell you, they would not say to you that I need a repeatable sales process for my, my team mix to exercise to execute against. But that's what they that's what's missing for them. Because if you think yeah. about what their sales force is designed. They're a professional sales organization is designed to repeat a proven process over and mm -hmm. over again, just be very, very efficient about it. That's what every professional sales organization, if you hand them a product that mm -hmm. doesn't have that in place, they're going to yeah. fail because they're not we designed. We need to get to, that, to get to that repeatable sales process so they can then expand on that. Correct. So yeah. as a startup, and they, they know that they've got to get a company to a certain part of the scale in the marketplace mm -hmm. before they can successfully manage it. So as a startup company, what you want to do is get to that repeatable process and show the repeatability yeah. of it as soon as possible. Because if you can go to them and say, listen, I've got this great technology. It solves this process problem. It solves this clinical problem right here. This is what we're, then this is the benefit of solving that problem. Mm -hmm. We know all about that. 
Oh, but by the way, over here, here's how you sell the product. Mm -hmm. Here's and here's the metrics. Here's the steps in selling that process. Yeah. And here's the metrics that we have in place to prove that we know how to execute those steps. Your team can take this process that we've proven works and we mm. can just drop it in there and from day one. And now they can take what you can't scale efficiently and they can now the 10x for them works because they have a process that they can apply this professional sales organization and a professional marketing organization to scale very quickly. And that's yeah. what, you know, and as a startup company, that's the gap you've got. You, you don't have those resources to scale like they do. And that's yeah. where they get the leverage and that's what they're looking to buy. Yeah, and that that makes sense. You know, I think from a startup perspective, you know, it, it seemed kind of annoying that you know these bigger companies are buying at later and later stages. But when you put it that way, that makes sense. You know, we we have different roles and different expertise and different ability to uh, you know different levels of the ability to pivot quickly. And it's also why you know we step back to an early conversation we had you want to start early on the market development as well as the product development because mm -hmm. if your market if you've got a product development is at this stage and your market development's back here you mm -hmm. mismatch and you know your product may be ready to act yeah. to, to be acquired but you mm -hmm. the market the market side of your business isn't ready to be acquired so that's why you want to start you want to start thinking about doing both those things in parallel that's a really good point. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think the last thing I want to finish is um, so a lot of the people in um, in my community, my entrepreneurial community, are early stage health and med tech entrepreneurs. And so you know, I want to encourage everyone to get get started with the market development, not just the technical or clinical development uh, right now. So what are three things that we should do as early stage entrepreneurs to start developing the market now? Got it. So the very first thing is to make that mind shift to, okay. And, and so if you look at the data and this isn't medical device, this is general startup mm -hmm. data, 90% of startups fail. Mm -hmm. And, and of that 90% that fail, 90% of that failure lies on the market development side, not the product mm -hmm. development side. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to say earlier that what I do isn't rocket science. But the truth is about what we're doing, product development follows the physical laws of nature, mm -hmm. thermodynamics, physics, you know, there's physical laws that follows. Market development follows the laws of human nature, which are <laughs> much grayer. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it, it goes, it goes to, you know, it, and there's a lot of ambiguity on the mark on the, on the market development side. So, but the the risk, the biggest risk for any company in the startup world is on the market development yeah. side, and it's a 10x risk. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing to do. Start making that mind shift that we you need this that that's where the risk lies, and we need mm -hmm. to start answering those critical questions as early as we can in our company development cycle. So that's right. number one. Number two is, and this is fundamental, and this is what I core teaches and and we all know this, but we're not, we're not always disciplined to do it. As a startup company, you cannot create markets. You've got to tap into an existing market. And when they say existing market, you got to tap into an existing problem that your market's already trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So those are the, so, and that's, and that's doing the hands-on customer discovery work, getting out and talking to your potential customers, going deep into conversations with them, getting into getting into the sales data as well as mm -hmm. the needs data early on to understand that. Um, and then the third thing I'll say, I'll say is that we need to start paying more attention on the market development side to the post sale piece of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're doing with looking at the needs and the buying process and the economics of it, that's the pre-sale part of it. But we alluded to it early on in this discussion. One of the things you want to start doing with customers pre-launch is understanding how the device, how your technology is going to work in their hands. Because yeah. your product, if you if a surgeon uses your ultrasound and uses it three times and decides he doesn't like it, doesn't want mm -hmm. to use it, your company's not going to survive. Yeah. So so you got to figure out early on how to get it in their hands, how to go through the learning curve to change how what they're doing today to what you're doing, 
and when and how to get what I, I call to normalization where it's not the new thing, it's just the way they do that particular mm. procedure going forward. So that's the other thing is that we've got to look at the whole picture, just not the sales picture on the market development, but what I call the adoption picture. So mm. everything that happens post-sale to get it to become the normalized part of the process. Um, so those are three three things. I'm sure I could come up with more, but those <laughs> are the three things I would start thinking of. Yeah, those are things that popped in my mind today. Wonderful. This was really helpful, Chris. Thank you so much. Leo, it's been my pleasure. I, you know, I, I can talk about this all day long. So it's, uh, I, you know, happy to do it. Wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome.